Hi, I'm Carl Taylor, and I'm here to talk you through the Hasselblad Focus software for the Hasselblad cameras. This is the software that you use for shooting tethered or importing your raw files for processing your raw files. There's a lot of functionality uh, in this incredible piece of software. I'm gonna guide you through the software interface, give you an overview of the main tools, and then go into some of the uh, specifics about importing, exporting files, scene calibration, and some of the uh, sort of specialist areas as well. So let's get started with looking at the main focus interface and an explanation of the main tool set. So as you can see here, I have a number of files from a shoot loaded in on the left hand side as thumbnails and I can navigate through uh, these image files simply by clicking on them or I can use my arrow keys on my keyboard. Now you may have noticed actually that I'm working with a two screen setup here with a laptop and with uh, my main screen. Now for the purpose of this uh, tutorial or walkthrough, I'm just going to use focus in the single screen setup and we're recording that single screen so you can see what's going on. But I actually commonly use focus in a dual screen setup where I have my thumbnails and panels and adjustment panels on one screen and then I have a full screen image on the other screen. That's very easy to do if you simply use uh, the window command and say viewer in separate window, that will give you a dual screen setup. But for the purpose of today's walkthrough, we're going to use the single screen setup. So, as I said, the images are already imported on this because these were shot tethered from the H6 camera, tethered into focus. And I can navigate through the images. You can see that the images uh, have a color coding on them. At the moment, they've all got a green dot assigned to the images. And this is just uh, basically a way of rating your images. So for example, if I decided that this particular image I wanted to rate at a higher uh, level, I could rate that with an orange or yellow dot, sorry, uh, by pressing number seven, or I can rate it as an eight, which would give it a red dot. And then I can use the uh, color codes up here to differentiate the files so that I can look at just selected ones with either a yellow dot or a red dot or all of them, etc., etc. Now, many of you may also be familiar with the star rating system. The star rating system is very simple. Again, you just press the number. So I press three and that gives it three stars. And I can differentiate or rate all my images from zero stars through one, two, three, four, five, and then look at them and view at them, uh, view them based on that star rating by selecting the number of stars up here. So this is a great way to filter your images when you're organizing your files and trying to decide which files uh, you want to work with. There's also a comparison tool, uh, but we're coming on to that a little bit later. So back to the main interface um, within focus. So at the top left, we have the capture function, which is when you are shooting tethered, you can control your camera and tell it to, to capture an image. And that's the button there, but it is also over here in the capture panel on the right hand side in the orange trigger capture button there. Export feature is exactly as it sounds. It's when you've decided which files you want to export into a different format because we're working with the files in a 3F format at the moment, which is the raw file format. And when we choose export, we can choose a number of different uh, output uh, settings. Here I've got TIFF file 16-bit and I can choose the sequence name or I can choose to rename the files to a different uh, sequence of numbers uh, or something that I set in specifically. I can give it a job name which gives the uh, sequence number a, a starting prefix name um, as I designate it in here. I can also, with the additional output uh, feature selected, I can set to export a second set of files so I can export a set of JPEGs as well as a set of uh, main TIFF files if I wanted. Now within the export functions, you've also got edit and in the edit functions, you can create your own custom export settings. So if you want to specifically export files at a given size, a given uh, dimension, uh, a given quality, a given profile, um, 
and then you can set all that up and save uh, new presets that you create here so that you can choose from those in the preset menu here, uh, giving you the ability to basically export your files in a variety of formats, uh, as well as the standard ones there. So export, very straightforward, uh, very easy to do. And you'd obviously normally undertake your export after you've made your adjustments to your picture, your exposure, your shadow, your highlight control, color adjustments, and once you're happy with the image. Obviously, if you're already happy with the image as it is in its standard form, you can export, choose to export, straight away. The import feature is um, very simple. That is when you are importing images off of the memory card. So for example, if you're using the C fast cards with the H6, you can import them from the memory card. If you've been shooting on location untethered, you can import them from the memory card through a card reader into your computer. And then you need to choose import them into focus. The modify feature is an excellent feature if you make an adjustment to one particular image file. So let's just show you that. For example, let me just choose this particular image file. So if I want to adjust the exposure of this image file, maybe darken it down a little bit, um, increase the shadow fill, for example. Let's say I want to put a, add a little bit of clarity, um, potentially boost the contrast. If I wanted to make those modifications, and then I decided, you know what, I really like that modification. I want to apply that to uh, all of the images or a number of the other images. Then I can simply select the other images by uh, using the command or the shift key to highlight the uh, given files that I want to apply that to. And then I can hit modify. And then you can uh, choose to add all of the adjustments that you made to those other files simultaneously. Now, if you didn't want to choose all of the adjustments, so say, for instance, you made a crop on one image, but you didn't want to apply that crop to the other images, you only wanted to apply the color or contrast adjustments, then you could say uncheck all, and you could then go back in and choose to say, OK, I just want to apply the color correction and the exposure correction adjustments. And then you click modify, and then Focus will automatically modify the other image files that you had selected to the same setting as the first file that you modified. If you want to undo the modify, you can just click undo modify adjustments of images and then that will put them back into the previous state that they were. Uh, the original um, image that you modified would also be put back into the previous state as well. Now, in addition to that, if you make an adjustment, for example, on say this image, and I wanted to adjust the exposure, say a lot brighter, for example, if I choose this tab here, then I can say modify exposure of selected files rather than going into the modify command at the top left there. And that way works out quite quickly for making modifications because I can choose a number of files that I want to modify just with that exposure adjustment without having to bring up the modify dialog and without having to uncheck a number of the settings. I can simply go modify exposure of selected files and it will now modify those files just with the uh, settings that were adjusted in this one particular panel in the exposure panel. And that applies to all of the other panels that where you can uh, make different adjustments and modifications. So you can be more specific rather than having to uncheck all of the different uh, modify uh, requirements in the modify dialog box. Anyway, I'm just going to undo those modify um, selections. Now, uh, also, just to bring to your attention, if you look at the thumbnails, we can increase the size of the thumbnails up here with the plus and minus. So I can de decrease the size of the thumbnails, or I can increase the size of the thumbnails, and I can drag my interface around to allow more space for the thumbnails if I want and reduce the size of the main window, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you'll notice here uh, on the thumbnail that if there is a pencil or pen mark showing like in the icon here, that means that the image has had some modifications. 
Okay, let's just put the interface back to a smaller uh, size on the thumbnails and giving me a larger size on the main window again. Let's continue on with the uh, settings in the menu at the top here. So we have a delete option. If I click delete, it just asks me if I want to move the file to the trash. Now this is very useful because you don't accidentally want to delete the file completely at this stage because you may make a mistake. You may have pressed this by accident. So simply by pressing delete and saying move, it just puts the file in the trash uh, and it won't be deleted obviously until you empty your trash. So I'm gonna cancel out of that. There is a slideshow feature here, which is self-explanatory. You can select a number of image files and it will play those as a slideshow. And then we also have the preferences uh, dialog box here, which has a number of different um, features. In the general features, we've got the preferences for the size of the preview image, um, the initial approval level for the image, that's the rating of the image, the green, yellow or red dots. Uh, flash delay time, uh, your chosen image editor, a few other features on there. Then we have uh, under triggers, uh, a number of uh, settings that we can apply. And this is basically layout triggers. So if you operate your camera in different conditions, so say you might be doing a shoot for portraits, you might be doing a shoot specifically for um, product photography, or you might be on location shooting tethered with your laptop uh, shooting landscapes, you can specify the layout of um, focus to suit a certain scenario. And focus will recognize the scenario uh, and choose which layout you would like based on the camera connection, whether you're inserting a CF card into importing into focus. So therefore you could have potentially set up a preset for importing all of your landscape images with a given uh, style, look or black and white or tint, etc., etc. And these triggers you can basically use to customize the layout of focus to suit and speed up your workflow based on these different working scenarios. Then you have the mobile um, setting where you would um, need to um, connect your Wi-Fi on your camera to your focus. And this allows you to work remotely, uh, allows your clients, if they're in your studio, to also be viewing your focus software remotely on their iPads, uh, smart tablets, that type of thing as well. Those features can all be found, as I say, in the preferences setting here. Layouts, um, we have the standard layout. Now you can see in the standard layout that the thumbnails have moved over slightly to the right and I have now a menu structure on the left hand side and this is basically the structure, file structure of where you can find your images, where your images are being stored. I don't really like working with that layout so with the show panel, we can obviously change the layout of the focus interface. Here I've removed the browser function uh, to clean up and declutter my workspace. The next one is the viewer, which allows us to view uh, all of those as thumbnails. Um, or we can customize this with thumbnails with the browser, number of different options. We also have um, thumbnails on or off, so we can go to a full screen or almost full screen image. And on the right hand side, we can remove the tools from the right hand side as well to get us to a much cleaner interface. If you're working with a dual screen setup, then you can have that image full screen on one and all your other stuff on the other screen, which is uh, the way that I also like to work. So let me just get back to uh, with thumbnails, um, but removing the um, browser options on the left hand side. Then further over here, we have portrait and landscape. And if we click that, you can see quite clearly what that does. If you want to free up some real estate here, you can basically click the minus button to reduce the thumbnail size here. And you can then change the browser height by dragging down 
and increasing your main window size and decreasing the thumbnail area size. I'm going to revert back to landscape as we were. So we move along to the adjustment presets and if we look at the menu here we've got the standard which is the one that I use but we've got a number of different presets and you can also create your own presets and looks as I said so when you import your files they come in at a given preset that you choose and you'll also notice that um, there are a number of extra ones here because I've made adjustments and modifications to some of those images and as I adjust an image um, what Focus has done is um, basically created if you like a temporary preset of my current adjustments. If we move further along we have reload, use the, la the last saved adjustment or actually save um, the current uh, adjustments as well. Further along the top here, we have the EXIF data showing the shutter speed used, the aperture, the camera lens, the um, ISO, etc. just at the top of the window. The file name, our star rating here, and again, the color coding for the images. The percentage zoom that we're in on the main window. Um, so I can obviously choose to zoom in by clicking plus here. And then I can pan around the image using the space bar, which is the hand tool down here, or space bar is the shortcut. So I can look at this in much more detail. We're just at 50% there, so I can go right into 100%. Uh, we can see all the fine detail that we've got in the image there. Uh, incidentally, also if we use the magnifier tool when we click in an image, that takes us into 100%. So I'm just going to zoom back out on there, 14% that fits the image in there and the image will obviously adjust in size to suit as I change the interface. Moving further along on the top here, we now have our main capture um, set of panels, browse, adjust and export and I'm going to run through these panels in more detail now. So starting off with our capture panel, actually what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to turn a camera on because I have a camera tethered in with the USB 3 into uh, my laptop. I'm going to turn the camera on, just wait for that to uh, come on and connect to the software. What you'll see here in this panel is that the camera uh, or the operations of the camera become visible in this panel and we'll be able to now, as you can see, control the ISO. We can control the shutter speed, as you can see here, the aperture, and we can see the battery level. I can lock the mirror up. I can go to live view. I can uh, choose the metering mode, exposure, exposure value, uh, fine tuning on the focus. There's a number of things as well as obviously telling the camera to take a capture, which is the way I work when I'm using it tethered. So I've got complete control over the camera using this capture panel. Now, interestingly, you'll see on all of these uh, individual panels, such as camera or job info or exposure, you will see this extra icon that my mouse is touching here. If you click on that, it basically expands the panel out into its own separate floating panel. Now, I find this very, very useful because if I'm working in a dual screen setup, I can choose which panels I want on which screen and I can position my panels wherever I want them. So these floating panels are are very very useful. If you click the um, downward arrow here this panel will disappear and it will dock itself back into the side menu, menu and if you click it again here it will reappear here. So it's exactly the same as it is when it's in the main menu on the right but it's now just a floating independent panel. Now, if uh, we look at the other panels um, moving further down, obviously if the camera is, sorry, if the camera is not tethered and not connected, then this particular panel is not active because this is related purely to the camera. So I'm going to just turn the camera off again and we should see the information about the camera disappear from that panel momentarily. So moving down to the job info panel, 
Um, this information is about where the destination of your image files is going to or coming from, uh, the name, the job sequence, the number sequence that you'd like to specify, uh, and also some additional metadata that you might want to apply with your copyright name, uh, website, the information, that sort of stuff uh, in there as well. So that's the job info panel. Now here's the main panel uh, that we're going to be using all the time, which is the exposure control panel. Uh, let's look at the main tools. We have uh, exposure value, which is quite simply uh, increasing or decreasing the exposure as we uh, feel uh, necessary. Contrast adjustment, brightness adjustment, recovery adjustment for recovering detail in the highlights. And we can recover an awful amount of detail in the highlights with the recovery adjustment. As a matter of fact, let's zoom in on this uh, tin of paint flying through the air here. Take a look at this tin. And we can see that uh, it's a glossy metal tin. It's been caught in the studio lights and it's quite uh, brightly exposed because of that. But with the recovery detail, I can pull up the recovery and you can see I can start to re recover an incredible amount of detail back into those highlights using the recovery. And that is the beauty of working with the Hasselblad Focus raw files. Um, they're very advanced raw files with a lot of information, a lot of data that can be recovered from the highlights and shadows. So that's the recovery adjustment. I'll just leave that cranked up for a moment. We've also got shadow fill, so I can get a lot of detail out of my shadows. And you'll find in many low light situations or where you may be shooting interiors, architectural shots, you can actually recover uh, a significant amount of shadow detail, the same with landscape shots, portrait shots, many different um, working scenarios. Um, the shadow, fill and recovery are excellent tools. Then we have clarity, which is like a local contrast adjustment, which basically just boosts uh, local contrast uh, as opposed to the general contrast a adjustment on here. So all of those tools are very useful. When you've made a number of adjustments to your image and you might want to see what they look like um, on and off quickly, you can just click this checkbox. And clicking that checkbox check just deactivates the settings that you've put in temporarily. So you can just do a quick preview to see what it looked like before and after, if you like. And then in the drop down menu here, again, we can create a preset. So if you like the settings that you've applied, you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to regularly uh, require these settings. I'm going to regularly uh, want to use these particular settings because I shoot images in this particular fashion and I like the look. Then you can create your own preset to uh, save those particular settings. OK, I'm going to close that panel, move down to white balance. White balance is obviously straightforward. Um, you can choose as shot. You've got a number of options, cloudy, daylight, flash, fluorescent, shade, tungsten. Or you can create your own custom. Or you can just start to slide around the color balance manually from cooler to warmer uh, light with the Kelvin temperature scale that we've got here. And you can also adjust your tint from more magenta to more green uh, in one direction, more magenta in the other direction. Now, um, when we're talking about the um, color balance and uh, white balance, you can also choose to use the information at the bottom here for picking a neutral part of your image or picking a neutral gray tone on a color checker card or measuring the data on the image. I will come to that when I get down to the bottom uh, settings on the bottom of the interface. So moving on to Capture Sequencer. Capture Sequencer is a, uh, an area where you can uh, apply if you're doing interval shots for time-lapse photography with a tethered camera, or if you want to set in uh, predetermined uh, aperture bracketing. So you can set in the amount of exposure bracketing, the order of the exposure bracketing, uh, and the amount of compensation, etc., in exposure you want to make on that bracketing, as well as pre-delays and uh, a number of other things. And you can create 
uh, and save additional um, settings here as well, create additional shutter offsets, aperture offsets as well. Not something that I use very often, uh, but um, for those people that may want to use their cameras for time lapse, uh, for sequences, that sort of thing, uh, that's a useful uh, panel in the capture sequencer. Uh, then adjustment layers. Now this is a fantastic addition to the focus tool set. Let me find uh, an area we can work on to show you uh, that a little bit more in detail. I'm going just to zoom out a little bit. So now with the um, focus software, we have the ability to use adjustment layers. And that is working on adjustment layers on the raw file and making adjustments to the images before we export them to our final designated 16-bit TIFFs or whatever uh, you want to export them as. So let's take a look at the adjustment uh, layers. So the first thing I would need to do is say I want to create a new adjustment layer, so I click Add Layer with the plus button, and then I decide what I want to do. So let's say, for instance, I want to make the orange in here a little bit darker. I can choose minus the exposure value, and then I can choose a brush tool and I can adjust the size of the brush using um, the size command here. And I can also adjust the flow rate and the amount of feathering of the brush as well. That's the softness, if you like, of the edge of the brush. So I've basically decided I want to make this orange darker for this um, example. So I'm going to run my brush over here. Now you can see the feathering is a little bit too strong there. It's a little bit too harsh. I'm just going to run that around, see if I can do it. It's actually probably going to work out OK. I just uh, I went slightly into the blue area. But you can now see that I can now manually adjust and uh, correct or even brighten that area uh, to suit my taste afterwards. So you're not fixed in stone the initial setting that you put in for that particular brush. You can apply it. Uh, you can apply it and then you can uh, adjust it afterwards as well. Uh, it's not only the exposure that you can adjust, you can adjust the sharpness, you can adjust the saturation, you can adjust a number of different things at the same time and you can turn it on and off to see the look that you've created. Now in addition to that you can create another adjustment layer, so now we have layer 2 visible, I can reduce layer 1 there. Now layer 2, I can apply a different brush to work on a different area. So if I wanted to increase, for example, the saturation on uh, the blue in the background or change the uh, brightness or um, details of one of the other areas, I can do that on a separate adjustment layer. And you can keep adding more and more adjustment layers. There's also um, additional adjustment layers for things such as the radial gradient as well, which is quite interesting. So in this instance, I'm going to apply a vignette. So I'm going to create uh, a lower exposure value, but instead of using the brush tool this time, I'm going to use the radial gradient. And I'm going to say, right, I want to gra drag a gradient out to this particular area, like so. And then I can adjust the exposure up and down. Now you can see that the exposure is darker in the middle, but if I click the invert checkbox, then it adjusts it. And I can also feather that gradient out there considerably there so that I create a softer vignette. And then I can now move on to a new um, adjustment layer. So now I'm on to layer three if necessary. I can close that one up, I can go back to layer two, I can go back to layer one, and I can go back into layer one, and I can change that brighter, or I can change it darker. So I still have all of the control uh, that I want with my adjustment layers independently um, uh, and continuing forwards. And again, with the tick box at the top, you can actually uncheck all of them to see the difference before and after. Additional to that, we also have the viewing of the mask. So if I just go back to layer one a moment, I'm going to turn layer two off. I'm just going back to layer one. I'm going to click the mask um, option to show the mask. And there you can see it shows me the area where I've made adjustments. It's quite clearly identified by um, seeing it with the mask. 
So that covers most of the uh, adjustment layer features. Um, we'll now move down to the bottom part of the focus interface. So at the bottom of the screen here, the first item is compare view. And this does exactly what it says on the tin. And if I click compare view, you can see it now shows me my selected image here with the dotted line around it, which is the one on the left. And it shows me this particular image here on the right. This is very useful for when you want to navigate through your images to decide whether one image is better than another image. And you can use your arrow keys like I'm doing here to navigate through to make your comparisons to your image, or you can use your mouse to click on the particular thumbnail. Now, you can also choose to view in a different uh, orientation. So if you go up to the top here, you click that A and B, it switches them to uh, up, up and down uh, compare view. So you can toggle that um, to suit your taste. And then over on the right hand side here, you have switch compare images. So if you decide that you want this image to become the hero shot, uh, and then uh, compare with others, you just press switch compare images and then that swaps them around. And now you can see that that particular image is the one that has the dotted outline around it. And if I start navigating around here now, you can see the other images become the compare images. So that's the compare function, very useful for editing your images, navigating through them and deciding which ones are your favorites. Just going to turn the compare view function off and go back to our main view. Crop tool is next and I can click crop tool and I can basically choose to crop the image as I feel uh, suitable. But we also have the option to crop a number of different options with the adjust settings. Now, I've omitted these panels up here at the moment. I'm gonna come back to those shortly, but I'm just gonna jump into the crop and orientation. So within the crop and orientation, as you can see here, I can set specific crop ratios or I can create a preset for a given crop that I wanna work with. Now, this can be very useful if you're working with specific page layout. So often I'm shooting for a magazine or an advertisement that's a specific shape and size. And it's very useful if I've got the art director with me to have those actual sizes put in in a crop preset and bringing them up on screen to make sure that everything compositionally in the image fits within the layout of that particular advert. So crop presets uh, is where you can do that. So that's the crop tool. And once you've set a crop tool, you can obviously move it around, bend it around in the standard format. Um, if you wanna remove the crop, just click outside of it and then it's gone and just turn the crop off. The line tool, just draw a line at a given angle and then it will rotate the image to suit that particular line. And once it's rotated the image, uh, you can use that to obviously straighten horizons and uh, make modifications like that. I'm just going to undo that command, put it back to where it was. Now, the reason I've come down to the bottom panel first before we go on to the other panels, because I wanted to show you the neutralization tool in relation to the white balance and um, some of the other things that we spoke about earlier. So if we look at our capture panel and we can see the white balance, um, we can actually choose now what the color balance of the image should be. So if you know that this area should be perfectly neutral in that tin, for example, I can click that and then it will make the image neutral based on that. If I knew that that paint there was specifically a neutral gray paint, I could click on it and it neutralizes the image to suit that particular paint. Now we're not seeing a great deal of effect with the image here because it was already neutral. But if I go and choose a different image file, for example, so we get this picture of Ben here where he looks a little bit orange because the color balance is way out. You can see he's holding up a color check card, which is great because I can now use the neutralize tool and I can select one of the tones that I know to be perfectly neutral gray and I can click on it 
and perfectly neutralizes the image for me. So obviously, if like me, you're a product and advertising photographer, you'll uh, regularly be using these sort of uh, color checker cards and putting them in your shop. It's even useful to put them in when you're shooting landscape pictures to take your first series of pictures with one of these in. And then you can always use that neutralization tool to bring your image to neutral, um, to perfectly neutral balance. And then if you want to, then you can slightly tweak it or modify the tint or the color balance afterwards. Uh, further along, while we're here, I'm also going to show you this particular tool here. And this particular tool is what's called the readout tool, but basically it tells you the RGB values. So if I click there, you can now see that it's showing 113 in the red channel, 113 in the green and in the blue because it's perfectly neutral on that particular gray. If I choose red, you can see the color numbers are different. They're more orientated to stronger in the red channel. And you can put these things all over your image for checking uh, different portions of the shot. I find this particularly useful as well for checking whether I've got pure whites in a given area or a given part of the shot. And you can see just on Ben's shoulder there, uh, the values uh, that it's showing is 255 in each channel, which as we know is uh, pure white. So um, it's uh, a very useful tool, the neutralize and the um, checker readout tool as well, often using those two tools in combination. So I'm just gonna deactivate those. Let's move to the zoom tool. Now uh, the zoom tool is self-explanatory. Let me just go back to another picture with some more detail in. Click the zoom button, put the zoom tool uh, where I want to view the image. And there we go, it zooms in to a hundred percent and then it generates a full resolution preview for me and I can move around and pan using the hand tool, which is the tool alongside here and do so like so. Or I could stay on the zoom tool and simply use the space bar to drag and move the image around. Now that takes me into a hundred percent zoom but of course I can use the plus and minus up here if I want to actually go in further, if I want to go into 200% or if I wanted to minus out a little bit to 50% as well. So I can modify that as well. So moving along further, let me just zoom out on the picture. I'm going to show you the next ones are the shadow warning and the highlight warning. So if I click highlight warning, it brings up, you notice that area there on, under the base of that paint tin went to a cyan color because it's showing me an area that is blown out beyond white. And if I uncheck it there and click shadow warning, we can see we have no areas where there is shadow detail that is lost uh, beyond black in that particular image. So nothing to worry about there. Um, let's go to an image where we've got maybe a bit of a mixture let me find, where was the one we were working on before? Let's go back to that one. Now, if I click highlight warning, it is bringing up a highlight warning here, you see on that part of the image. But if you remember, we were actually able to recover that data. And as I recover it, you can see the highlight warning disappears. So the highlight warning shows you where the image has peaked out white or beyond white and then the highlight warning will disappear as you use the recovery tool. But remember that not every image has to have whites that are contained within the perfect white. Sometimes you're quite happy for the whites to be pure white or uh, to look overexposed in certain parts of the image. But the um, highlight warning is a useful tool for allowing us to see uh, and recognize these areas immediately. I click shadow warning. Again, in this particular image, there is no shadow areas uh, that it considered a problem. Now, moving on to the next one, we have the grid tool. Now, the grid tool is very useful for lining up things in your images, especially in studio environments, product photography, but also with the landscape work if you're shooting tethered. Now, I've only got it in a simple uh, split um, quadrant there, but if I click the right click or control click and bring up the grid options, we can see here I can specify the amount of lines for the grid and how many lines and squares, if you like, that I want the grid to show. 
And also I can specify the color of the grid. And this is very useful because sometimes you're uh, working on an image that may have gray in it and these gray lines wouldn't stand out. So if I click the specify color, I can now choose whatever color I want for the grid um, to make it stand out uh, more prominently. So that's the grid options. We then have the overlay tool. Now the overlay is a fantastic feature when you want to drag an image, a PNG file. Uh, for example, if I'm working with art directors and they're giving me a layout for an advert for a magazine, um, we can drag the PNG file into the focus software here so that I can see all the copy and the placement for all the logos and the text in the advert but still see my image underneath that transparent PNG file with all the text in place. This greatly assists you when you're working on layouts, shooting in the studio, when you're having to adjust your composition to suit a specific advertisement with copy in specific places. The other time that I use the overlay mode is if you've shot one particular image and you need to shoot another, but another object um, maybe has to be in a slightly different position, but one object has to remain, you can drag the first shot into this shot and then you can align everything and make sure that everything lines up perfectly and you can just reduce the opacity by checking overlay options, and then you can adjust the opacity and scale, etc., of the image that you've dragged in there. So the overlay function, uh, very useful, uh, particularly useful with uh, dragging in uh, PNG files um, when working on uh, layouts with art directors. The next one is just simply selecting the image left and right, so you just can navigate through your images in that fashion as well. And then further over, we've got our red, green, and blue values based on wherever my mouse is pointing in the image. And we can switch to different modes, whether we want to use lab mode or output mode, um, but I tend to stick with the standard RGB. So that's the bottom part of the interface covered. And we're now going to revisit the panels on the top right-hand side here. So, the first one that we looked at was the capture. We're now moving into the browse um, menu. And we have capture info, which is the metadata, if you like. We have the, what's called IPTC core. And that is where we can put in additional metadata, things like our address, email description, further uh, information. We can also add keywords in there, using uh, keywords or editing, adding keywords. We have the navigator and zoom function, which basically allows us to move around and pan around the image in this format. And we can see a magnified version of a given area of the image in here, or we can use it as a standalone loop feature um, by clicking and seeing the image in more detail on uh, the side there. This is actually quite useful when you're working in dual screen mode and you wanna have um, an extra area where you don't show the full screen image at 100% magnification all the time. You can have the image full in, uh, see actually at 400%, let me go out to, let's go to 200%. Uh, and this just allows you to click around the image without having to change the whole image on screen um, and just simply check the details in specific parts of the image. So that's the navigator and zoom function. And then below that, we've got the standard histogram where it's showing the values of exposure throughout the image from our shadows through to midtones to highlights in the red, green, blue channels individually or in them together. And we can also adjust the histogram endpoints if we desire. Moving on now to the adjust panel. Now, the adjust panel has, as you can see, a lot of drop down menus in here. Some of them are actually uh, already uh, repeated, if you like, in the capture panel. Um, but let's start again. Histogram we've already looked at, which is a repeat from the browse. Exposure we've already looked at, which was in the capture panel. 
white balance was also in the capture panel. But now we're moving into sharpness adjustments. And if you feel your image needs a tiny little bit more bite of sharpness, you can go and add uh, or reduce, if necessary, the uh, sharpness as uh, to suit your tastes in this particular panel. Adjustment layers we've already looked at, that's repeated here. Curves adjustment, if you've used Photoshop, then you'll be very familiar with using curves and how curves respond uh, with dragging up, say as I'm dragging up the midpoint of the curve here and adjusting the midtones while the uh, black points and the white points of the image remain fixed. Or I can add additional dots on the curve to create an S curve for adding contrast, etc. So those of you that are familiar with curves, you will find a curves adjustment panel uh, to use here. If you want to get rid of those curve points, just simply click on the dot and press the backspace or the uh, delete key to take the curve back to its original setting. Color correction, let's just pop this one out as a separate panel in this case. Um, I often have the color correction panel out as a floating panel and um, we can set in here our saturation amount. So you can see I'm increasing saturation or I can increase uh, vibrancy, which uh, increases basically or enhances the lower saturated colors, uh, the more nuanced colors. Um, I generally personally uh, use my saturation at about six to eight on most of my images anyway, and I could create a preset so that it's always uh, set at that. One of the great tools with the uh, color correction is that you've got the color picker. You can go in and select a color, and you can see that's now showing that color on the color wheel here. And I can now go and change the saturation of just that particular color independently of everything else. And I can also choose to lighten that color if I want to, or darken that color if I want to, or even change the hue of that color. So there I can make that color more green, or I can make it more red, and I can shift that around uh, using the saturation tool. I can uh, create another color picker, select my blue background, for example, this time, increase the saturation there of my blue background, independently from the rest of the shot because there's nothing else blue in the picture. Obviously, if there was something else blue in the picture within that particular blue value, it would also be affected by what I was doing. So um, that's the uh, color correction tool. If you want to reset the tools, just double click them. They go back to their zero point. If you want to get rid of the points, click on the dot that you created and hit the delete key and they will disappear. Grayscale, um, this is if you want to work on the images in black and white. Notice that this is unchecked. If I check it, then the image becomes black and white. And then I can adjust my mix and balance of the red, green and blue channels to create a black and white look that I particularly like. Obviously, I don't want black and white on these, so I'm going to uncheck the grayscale. Noise filter. Um, we're going to come back to this one because there's also the moiré uh, reduction for removing moiré from fabrics, textures, that sort of stuff. Uh, very, very well controlled moiré in uh, the Focus software. I'll come back to that one uh, a little bit later. Dust removal. Now, sometimes when we're working uh, with our cameras, we get dust on the sensor of the camera. Now, with a medium format camera, it's really easy because we can actually just take the back of the camera off and clean it. But um, if, for example, you didn't notice the dust until after the shoot, you can go in and you can specify, right, I've got a piece of dust here, and it, you can specify the size of the uh, bit that you want to fix as well. You can say, right, I've got another one here. And then you can um, apply the amount of uh, correction, if you like, on that dust to remove that dust. And then you can apply that correction to every other image that has dust in the same place. Because quite, it's quite common when you shoot a series of images that the dust um, appears in, in one particular place on your background and then you see it repeated in exactly the same place in the same place. So you can use this tool to remove the dust on not just one image but on a whole series of images if you uh, forgot to clean the sensor. Turn the dust off. 
Lens corrections. Now, lens corrections are set by default on the um, focus software because the focus software recognizes which lens you're using. So for example, it recognizes that I'm using the 150 millimeter lens here and it is making any necessary uh, correction for that particular lens uh, to do with vignetting or chromatic aberration. Um, and it will do that by standard. And if you are using a different lens um, that it hasn't recognized, you can actually um, select the lenses, especially if you're using the older V system, uh, you might be using the new CF feedback on a V series camera. And those particular lenses, Focus Software will give you a list of the lenses and you can choose lens corrections to suit those particular lenses. Scene calibration, I'm going to come back to afterwards. Crop and orientation, we already mentioned uh, about cropping, but we also have a straighten tool in here um, as well as our line tool. So we can choose to uh, adjust the crop, constrain the crop, create presets as I pointed out before. Output preview is simply the default setting that you want generally when you do an export. So I've got mine set to TIFFs at 16 bit, full size files, full resolution, and um, that will be the standard um, export setting um, that's used when I choose export. Adjustment browser. Now this is a useful feature for creating your own presets. So when you're importing a series of images that you may have shot on location and you want them to have a certain look, you could create a user-defined preset. You can see I've got one there called Carl's Look, um, but I can create another one here called Landscape. And in that landscape preset, I might decide that I want a certain amount of saturation for all my landscape images, and I want a certain amount of exposure or contrast adjustment, and I can create that by simply adjusting my settings here, creating that user-defined preset, and then specifying that preset on import. So when I import all my files, I can specify I want that user-defined preset to be applied to all the images that I import. So it automatically makes all those adjustments to it without me having to do it individually afterwards. So a very useful uh, feature in the adjustment uh, browser panel. And we've obviously got our factory uh, standard presets, which is the one that I commonly use as well. Reproduction, I'm gonna come back to that in a short while. That's more specifically for uh, archival museums, uh, people that are recording uh, paintings and need them to be uh, very precise color settings to suit their lighting and their setup. So we'll come on to that in a moment. Then over to our export panel, we have the queue because I can choose to export multiple images at a time. I can so I can say I want to export all of those or I can export 200 or as many files as I like and that will put them into a queue and you'll see them exporting. You'll see the information about which ones have exported and which ones haven't. And you can also pause the export as well in the queue uh, dialog box there. Capture info, we've seen that one already. IPTC core we've seen already and output preview we've already seen. So I'm now going to move up to the very top menu here, at the top there, the focus menu, and run through a few of those um, commands in the top menu system settings. So moving along to the top menus, um, some of these will already have been covered. So the preferences menu we already looked at, which is the same as that one here. Um, hide focus, uh, hide others, quit focus. Uh, capture, um, useful thing there, the command N uh, option, if you wanna use your keyboard to do a capture rather than pressing the orange button on the interface. Export, um, update firmware. Um, so this is for, for updating the firmware on your camera. Um, which will come to you via a download from the website. 
the uh, undo commands and then uh, the crop commands, save adjustments, last saved adjustments. So most of these commands we've already seen, but we haven't seen rotate clockwise, which is uh, self-explanatory, as you can see there, or rotate counterclockwise, or flip the image horizontal as well. So some useful um, features with the image section here. View, uh, a lot of these we've already covered. Can't see anything else different there. So just a repeat of some of the commands that are on the interface anyway. Window, zoom, minimize, minimize all. That's all your standard sort of uh, operating system type adjustments. Then we've got the uh, hide tools, show browser, and view in separate window, which is great if you're working on a dual screen setup. Also full screen viewer if you want to expand the focus window to fill the screen completely. And you can, again, create different layouts for different working uh, scenarios that you like and save those scenarios and different tool sets. Now the camera configuration is one that we're going to look at in more detail and the color calibrations uh, that we're going to look at next. So the camera configuration brings up this dialogue and you will need your camera tethered to your computer to focus. And this gives you some great controls over the way your camera is configured, basically. Let me just move that out of the way. So if we look at the settings, I can actually choose to adjust the settings. So what I would need to do is create a new profile or a new set here. And I'm gonna just call this my config. And in my config, I can now go in and choose to adjust what the buttons do on the camera. So for example, on my Hasselblad, um, by default, they have the aperture setting on the top wheel and the shutter speed on this wheel. And I don't like that. I actually prefer it the other way around. I prefer to have the shutter speed on the top wheel and the aperture settings on the bottom wheel. And that's very easy to fix because I can go into camera configurator and I can choose to make these adjustments here. I can also choose what some of the menus, uh, the buttons on the back of the camera do, uh, as well as uh, specifying a number of different features for the focusing system uh, or different ways the camera works or is displayed, or what the functions on the front of the camera do, such as the self timer, the mirror lock up, and basically just make the camera more user friendly to suit the way that you like to work. And it really is that simple. Um, within the exposure settings, you can choose the increments of exposure, whether you want them in half stop settings or third stops or full stops. Uh, the color temperature when shooting in manual, uh, the delay time for the mirror, lots of uh, little more technical adjustments that you can apply. So you can completely customize the camera to suit how you like to work. And also we, uh, earlier we looked at the interval timer and the bracketing timer with the capture sequencer. And there are some of those controls in this camera configuration uh, panel as well. So that's the camera configurator. You can go in there, great deal to play around with uh, to set the camera up to your own shooting requirements. So in the uh, same menu under camera configuration, we also have color calibrations, but I'm gonna look at color calibrations using it from the menu over here in a moment. But before we do that, we're going to look at the Moire removal feature this is a very powerful feature in the focus software. So if we just navigate to an image that we've already got pre-selected that has a lot of Moire problems in it, uh, just one that Hasselblad have had created as an example, picture of a mattress here. You can see there's a, a color checker card down there 
And if I just first of all go over here, so for example, I could neutralize this image here. It's already pretty neutral. But what we can see is if we look at the mattress, there's a huge problem with moire in the image where you've basically got that interference pattern of the thread, the fibers, the texture interfering with the uh, sensor and the cross resolution is causing this moire problem. Now, uh, we can solve that problem by using our adjustment layers. And our adjustment layers is the best way to reduce uh, the moire problem. So let me just close up my panels here and close up that one and go into adjustment layers. And within adjustment layers, I will, let's so I've got an adjustment layer there already. I'm going to remove that adjustment layer just so we start from scratch again. So I'm going to say plus adjustment layer and you can see in the adjustment layers dialog box there, we have moire and I'm going to apply say a setting of three or four as a moire correction and I can now use my brush tool to apply wherever I believe there is moire that needs to be corrected. So for example, if I paint on this line along here, and we just wait for that to update, you can see the moire has been removed very, very uh, well there, very clearly, very precisely. Now obviously in this image, there's a lot more moire, so I could increase the size of my brush tool and I could apply this to a much larger area if necessary. Now this image is quite an unusual example because there is moire over a great portion of the image. Quite often we'll find moire uh, occur in fashion images, maybe on just one particular area of a jacket or one particular area of a bit of fabric. And that's why using an adjustment layer is a much more precise way of controlling it because you can just paint over that specific area for more precise moire control. Now if I just zoom back out on the image here and we select the um, mask, we can see where we've applied the moire correction by using the brush tool and the mask. Obviously I could have painted the whole mattress to apply moire correction to the whole thing. But as I said, this is quite an extreme example. Generally speaking, we would not have this level of moire problem. So a more specific and controlled approach by using our adjustment layers and our brush tool, uh, we can achieve the uh, complete moire reduction that you can see that we've achieved here. And let's just flick that on and off for you. There you go, there's the moire back again, and there's with the uh, layer taking that moire uh, away with the moire removal adjustment layer. So I'm now going to move over to something called scene calibration. Uh, this was one of the menus in the adjust um, settings just down here. Here we are, uh, scene calibration. Now this particular feature is generally for photographers using technical cameras, quite often in architectural photography, but also in some reproduction, archival um, records, painting, photography, that type of thing as well. Uh, and the reason is that when you take the digital back off of a Hasselblad camera, you can use these backs on technical cameras. So we can put this onto something like a Linhof um, view camera. And when you're shooting with a technical camera, you're often applying movements to correct uh, converging angles for architectural, etc., perspectives, that sort of stuff. And in doing so, the way the light is hitting the sensor changes because the light isn't coming in directly through the normal lens straight onto the camera uh, and then hitting uh, the image circle as it would in a standard way. You may be uh, adjusting the parallels, if you like, of the lens from the uh, digital sensor plane. And in doing so, this can often cause um, deformations, if you like, in the tone of color and contrast in certain areas, especially in the corners of our picture. 
Now, when you do this with a technical camera, you shoot a opal plate, if you like, in front of the camera, which looks like that. And you shoot one of those, and you can see this one is called 23 millimeter um, shot, and that one's 23 millimeter. And this acts as your scene calibrator to correct the problems that we've got going on up here with uh, the sky, with uh, areas in the corner going a little bit uh, different colors, etc. So how does this work? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, we go onto the image that we want to use as our scene calibration. We choose to create a calibration preset. Now I'm gonna call this one uh, windmill 23, just so it corresponds with the uh, file name. And say create. And I say remove cast and equalize intensity. And it's defaulted in at 100. I can reduce that a little bit if I want to knock it back. So I'm just going to knock that back to uh, 80. And I can now go over to the image and I can now on that image choose the preset that I've created, windmill 23A, and say remove cast, equalize intensity. And there you can see it has corrected the image and removed, if we turn that on and off, that's what it was without the correction. So it's removed the vignette effect that had been caused by the view camera and the tilt of the uh, lens uh, plane uh, in conjunction with the uh, digital back plane, and it has removed the color cast, removed any vignetting, and balanced the image exactly as it should be. So it really is that simple. You shoot the uh, blank uh, opal or perspex um, plate as your, uh, <clears throat> as your calibration, and then uh, load that into the focus software and apply the equalized preset on top of your image. Okay, so the final part that I wanna show you is the reproduction mode and the color calibration settings that can now be applied with focus. This is particularly useful if you are working under very precise or specific conditions where you may be recording historical documents or artwork or paintings in a museum format or a, an institute um, and you want to control the colors very, very precisely and accurately. Now, obviously the Hasselblad system is already set to record very accurate colors, but it is primarily focused on recording accurate colors for portraiture, people, product photography, studio photographers, landscapes. If you want a greater degree of control, for things like archival purposes, then this is where the uh, reproduction uh, panel and the camera color configuration can be useful. So over here we see reproduction mode. I'm just going to go to uh, a color swatch chart here that I photographed. Now I photographed this color swatch chart under the HMI lights that we are using at the moment, which is a daylight balanced continuous light source. And the first thing I need to do is to neutralize it. So I take my neutralize uh, tool here click neutralize and that's neutralized the gray as you can see and if we actually take our color values we can see look at that they should all be nice and neutral which they are turn that off again uh, now we basically want to create our own profile and the first thing I'm going to do is just check the box reproduction mode you can see how that adjusts the image there to a much more flatter looking image it's very similar to sort of a log file in video format and we've now got the option here in color calibration to go into edit and choose to create our own calibrated profile. So we'll target color checker on here. I'm going to say auto locate. And you can see that those red um, control area has automatically selected the color checker. I say calibrate and it has now calibrated it based on the information on the color checker. That's one of these, that is actually this color checker. So if you're a 
professional photographer in a studio environment or working in an archival environment, you'll be familiar with these type of things. Um, so these are a sort of test plate, if you like, um, for knowing exactly what the colors should be. So we've said calibrate. I can now name the calibration. It's named it by default at a specific date and time. And I say create and it's done that. I say done and that is my calibration uh, produced. And now I can now set my color calibration to that particular profile. And that's it. So now every picture that I take going forwards using that profile has been calibrated for this particular color chart under this particular lighting source. And then if you were going to shoot another series of images under a different lighting source or a different set of circumstances, again, you would introduce your color checker cart or your color checker chart, photograph it under those circumstances and run through this calibration process to suit. And that's it, it really is that simple. So hopefully that's given you a good overview of the Focus software. You can see how uh, versatile it is. You can see the uh, incredible level of control that you have over your images and how by using the Focus software, we have very precise adjustments and control over our raw Hasselblad files. Thanks very much.